Good evening. Um, welcome to Artist Space Books and Talks. Um, thank you very much for coming down this evening uh, for one of our programs for our Tom of Finland Pleasure of Play exhibition upstairs and at 38 Green Street. Tonight we have an artist panel looking at um, the legacy of Tom of Finland and queer art practice today. And I'm very happy to welcome Naden Blake, Carlos Mota, Collier Shaw, uh, moderated by Bob Nickus, um, for the discussion tonight. There's going to be three presentations, and then we'll just open into a wider discussion, just so you won't be surprised. OK, and without any further ado, I'll welcome Bob Nickus, who will say some more. Thanks, Harry. Um... Uh, I've never been down here. I did not know that Artist Space had a basement uh, private sex room, but <laughs> that also functions as an auditorium. Uh, but maybe later people can come back. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at you. I'm, if this I'm, was a sex club, there would be no sneakers allowed. No what? No sneakers. Uh, sneakers? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, on the chairs or on a lot of the chairs there is this great brochure for the exhibition uh draw your attention to the you know there were a lot of images that can could have been chosen for the cover and this one was chosen for the cover um you know people who write about art have all these bizarre ways of reading into images you don't even know like where do we get these ideas just make them up out of thin air most of the time but i think when you just look at an image it just tells you what it means. And, you know, Tom of Finland, I think for a long time, would say he was not a political artist, not a message artist. And then later he thought, oh, well, I was kidding myself because it turned out that I was, that his work had an influence, which is part of what we'll talk about tonight. So when I, you know, as one of these, uh, you know, people involved in the business of bizarre readings of images, uh, I would say this just says, you know, fuck the world. But not in that kind of aggressive, nasty way, because like a lot of Tom's work, it's really, it's about pleasure, it's about joy, there's a lot of humor. Um, it almost, it looks kind of wholesome, if you think about, I mean, I didn't mean wholesome, but you know what I'm saying? It could be, you know, like the most natural thing in the world. And uh, I think it says a lot uh, about what, you know, because I don't think his work is actually pornographic, and most people who like it don't, but it's still, Arou you know, it arouses a lot of, it inspires people. Um, something else we'll talk about tonight because it's about how artists are inspired and continue to be inspired by Tom of Finland's work. Um, who did we decide was willing to go for, okay. Uh, I, you know, no one has to answer this question. I just thought it was a good general opening gambit for, for everybody was to ask people how they first uh, encountered encountered these drawings because you know a lot of times with artists you encounter their work in galleries museums and tom of finland is an artist who people encountered you know, through other you know pathways uh okay nayland um Nayland blake uh how okay we're good um thanks bob and uh uh and thanks for that great lead-in because that's exactly what i was going to sort of talk about um uh i'm i'm glad to see that there are some other folks here who are sort of around my age um, and, and trying to sort of think about Tom. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my own personal history with him, but then also to try to think of, wrap my head around this idea of like, what's the influence about what, what how, if we want to talk about his influence, what that is. And, and I actually want to, I'll start off by disagreeing with you, Bob. I actually think his work is pornographic. And I think that the the, the problem that we often come up against is that we are so indoctrinated in the idea of talking about pornography as if it's a problem or a lessening of something um, that, uh, that when we find that something is good or something appeals to us, we try to rescue it from the pornographic. And, um, and I don't think that we need to do that with Tom. I think that Tom's work is actually like a great corrective to that idea. Um, he, my, the first times I encountered his drawings were um, in 
uh, editions of books that I can see right now that had like a black and white image on the cover and a, and a sort of colored band around them. I forget the press that did the imprint, but they were basically reprinting physique pictorials. And we're talking like late 70s, early 80s really. And, and I remember quite specifically going to the porn store, how many guys here remember it, on Christopher Street, um, past Bleecker, like past where the Lucy Lortel picture is. I'm seeing some people nodding and some thumbs up. So that particular porn store, I can't remember the name of it, on the south side of the street, southeast corner, um, had uh, clearly also had a little bit of a publishing thing. And they, uh, and they printed, uh, they were distributing a lot of these drawings. And so I would go down there and sort of pick those up. And then um, through that, I started to look around for those drawings and started to look for copies of Physique Pictorial and found those at places like Gay Treasures, on um, uh, uh, Hudson, thank you. Um, and then after, shortly after that, I moved out to San Francisco. And there's a store out there called The Magazine that, had, that, that uh, carried a lot of backdates of, of things. But the point I want to make with that is that you had to be a researcher and an archivist to find these things. They were not readily available to you. First, you had to feel OK going into the very specifically gendered space of a, of a porn store on Christopher Street. But secondly, you also had to know about this work because it was not always readily available. They weren't always in print. So we were sort of, I was sort of always on the lookout for them. And after some time in San Francisco, um, I got in touch with some of the other porn artists who were out there, a guy named Mark Chester, and through him, a guy named Rex, um, who were people who were drawing, uh, you know, who were taking photographs and drawing and contributing to the sort of leather community. And they were coming out of the sort of legacy of Tom. Um, and, uh, it turned out that Tom was coming to town. Some people in town knew about it. Um, and, uh, and I was commissioned by um, Outlook magazine to interview Tom and write, uh, and write about him. And so this is an issue from 1988. Um, Outlook is a really, really interesting publication because it is an outgrowth of some people who were working at Socialist Review um, who wanted to specifically write about gay and lesbian issues. Um, and, uh, but it was not a scholarly journal. Um, and so uh, it wasn't attached to any specific educational uh, organization. So I had the opportunity to interview Tom um, and, uh, and then to meet him when he came out to town. Um, and also to think about the work and the writing of this. And, I, and there's a couple of things that I sort of draw from it in terms of influence. One, you know, the, uh, one of the reasons why I was sort of cranky about the pornography thing is that one of the things that Tom said to me is that he basically would sit down and draw, like he would think of something and get a hard on and draw. And if he lost the heart on, he would chuck the drawing. <laughs> and so it, like, these drawings were made to arouse. They were made to arouse Tom. And if you think about him in the wake of World War II, um, basically drawing the men that he thought were attractive, the men who were around him, the men that he had crushes on, and putting them into fantasy scenarios that were meaningful for him. And then that work starting to find its way into these very small run magazines that were distributed through the mail. And also those magazines then became this really interesting network of feedback where people who subscribed to those magazines would write to Tom through those magazines and be like, I find your men incredibly hot. I would love to see them dressed in this. Here's a photograph of a California bike, uh, a motorcycle cop. I'd love to see one of your guys in that outfit. And his willingness to kind of adopt those, uh, those stylistic ideas, those 
garb ideas. He basically, what we think of as a Tom of Finland man, is something that was in, it evolved in a kind of consensual feedback loop between him and the men who were jerking off to his, to his drawings. And I think that's an, an, an interesting and powerful and unalienated relationship to art making that stands in a real kind of opposition to what we tend to think about as contemporary art making. And it's one of the reasons why, as much as I love the show that's upstairs, and, and the show that's, that's uh, you know, there, it's, it is odd to encounter those things in a public space, in a contemporary art space, because they are in many ways about a kind of privacy. They depict public situations, but they depict them in a way that is aimed at a private encounter. And, um, and, and that, I think, is something that we have tended to lose in, in thinking about a lot of contemporary art. So I wanted to talk about that, I, I talk about that sort of influence of developing an aesthetic and an approach um, in a kind of feedback loop with a public and the way that that allowed a sort of community to come into, into being. So the guys not only wanted to encounter um, those men in Tom's drawings, but also wanted to transform themselves into those men. And I think, you know, there would be no village people if it weren't for Tom of Finland. <laughs> Quite literally. Like, and there's an interesting way that in a particular pocket of um, the queer world, that style has remained fixed since, you know, practically 1955. It has not budged. The type of motorcycle jacket you wear, the type of boots you wear, the type of jeans you wear, what gets tucked into what, what type of cap you wear, all of those really codified outfits and appearances have had an amazing sort of impact because they've been a forum for any number of people, gay, straight, male identified, female identified, to project their own scaffolding of identity through. And that, I think, is an amazingly powerful and interesting achievement to think about for an artist. Um, I see that playing out these days, not in the contemporary art world with all of its constant anxiety about social interaction and it's, and it's sort of, um, to my mind, um, uh, uh, pointless e e elaboration and museumification of social interaction, but rather in places like DeviantArt and Fur Affinity, online communities where um, what are particularly underground sort of fan communities have a kind of commissioning feedback relationship with artists, creators, and who are developing consensual um, notions of identity and self-presentation back and forth in collaboration with artists. I think that's a really interesting um, thing that's going on right now. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to say was that um, I also really drew a powerful lesson from Tom's career. Um, I, you know, I, I said that there would be no village people if there wasn't for Tom of Finland. Well, we wouldn't know about Tom of Finland if it wasn't for Dirk Daner. And we, and it is, it, it cannot be stated enough that here is a guy who is not an art world person who saw these porn drawings that he loved and basically made it his life mission to rescue Tom from obscurity and exploitation. For years and years, for decades, the only way that you could see Tom of Finland's drawings were through um, the pirated editions of people who had basically ripped off his work for years and years before. And Dirk really changed all of that. He really um, made it so that the end of Tom's life was uh, powerful and meaningful. And I think the other person who really contributed to that in an enormous way is Hudson. Um, and uh, Bob, you and I At were talking feature about Feature Gallery. At, from Feature Gallery, and the first time that you saw those drawings of Tom's in real life was at, was at Feature. No, I saw them in magazines. 
Oh, okay. Well, I meant the but actual gallery, the physical feature, drawings yeah. Where, yeah. where, you know, Hudson started showing them at feature. And, um, and Hudson was basically the first gallery owner who didn't rip Tom off. Like Tom's, there had been any number of people who said to Tom, like, you know, Robert Mapplethorpe included, who were like, we want to do a big show of your work. Come on over and we'll, we'll fet you and all these people will admire you, blah, 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 blah. He would come over, he would bring the work, it would go up on the walls, things would disappear into private collections and Tom wouldn't see a dime. And, um, and Hudson was the first person who did not do that, who actually treated him fairly as an artist. And that is another really important achievement. And so I, I just want to close on that because I feel like so many times we put, we put ourselves in the role of viewers of art, but we also have a responsibility to perpetuate it in the way that a fan does. We have a responsibility to bring it forward. We live in a very difficult time where we have a technology that allows us to imagine that things will be remembered forever, right? Because we have this thing in us, this thing with us that seems to remember everything as soon as we ask it. But the truth is that there's tons and tons and tons of stuff that vanishes all the time because no one took the time to put it online. And we ourselves have a responsibility to perpetuate those things that we love. Um, so, thanks, my harangue. <laughs> um, I think Carlos does not remember the first time he encountered uh, uh, Tom's work, but I think you remember what the effect was. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I, don't re I actually don't remember when I saw it first, but I remember what it has done to me. And, and um, I want to thank Harry first and, and you for the invitation. Um, what I wanted to do was actually, as I was invited to do this, thinking about the work, it became um, a bit of a challenge for me to think beyond the arousal, think beyond the way that I had uh, come to learn uh, Tom of Finland's work as something that I looked off when I wanted to kind of get off in not, not, not specifically sexually, but in a kind of um, escape to a, to a time that uh, I felt nostalgic about or something. But then I actually uh, started to think about the violence that is present in, in Tom of Finland's work, and I wanted to kind of do a little trajectory through some images that I gave Harry to, to speak about the violence of erotic representation and how we have come to um, learn to speak about and name some of these images. So can we start? Uh so, um, some of the work that I have been doing has been uh, dealing with pre-Hispanic uh, homoerotic representations uh, and the ways in which these objects have been uh, resignified, renamed, categorized, or were through the, the, the process of uh, the colonial process. So, for instance, this one is um, a drawing that is attributed to the Maya culture, where you find, obviously, two men engaged in some kind of sexual, sexual interaction. Um, what, next. And this one, for instance, is one attributed to the Moche culture of Peru, where you have a similar kind of, of, of act. Uh, what became really interesting uh, to me, thinking about both Tom of Finland, but also about this, uh, these objects in the context of a larger body of work I have been producing, is how um, there was specifically no language to speak about these sexualities because in the process of the conquest everything was erased and everything was burnt and there's not, no documentation to speak about what they actually meant. However, the reading that has been given to them then, uh, and the categorization, which was another form of colonial imposition, has to do with a reading that is erotic and sexual and specifically uh, labeling and naming this, these objects as deviant, immoral and unnatural following the codes of, of um, uh, Christian um, sin um, and, and, and legalistic uh, crime relationships. So um, this is a Turkish representation that I found in, in, in an archive as, as well of, of a group scene, of course. Next. The, um, afterwards, I, I've been working on a series of films that, that um, speak about precisely that problem that I'm, that I'm naming. And this is uh, an illustration I developed um, to represent an anecdote that I found in one of these archives, uh, a moment when a Spanish conquistador is going up the mountain and he encounters 
a scene like that, a kind of chain of sodomites uh, uh, pe penetrating themselves, and he becomes so violently furious because this is definitely something that is defying the, the laws of God and so on, that he burns the men alive, not before having sent dogs to eat them alive. Uh, and I think that's actually a point that I want to make in terms of looking at Tom of Finland's work a little bit later, is how the way that we think of sexuality, the way that we think of this collective um, um, kind of I imagination that has been built around uh, the representation of the homoerotic is intimately tied to uh, an act of erasure and repression and oppression. Can you move to another one? So you have something like this, for instance, which is uh, represented in the Chronicle, in La Crónica del Perú, the Chronicle of Peru, that is already depicting a kind of uh, collective burning of the figure of the sodomite. The next one, Harry. And this one, which perhaps some of you have seen before, which is by, by the Dutch uh, illustrator Theodore Debris, where uh, he is depicting the um, Comandante Balboa in the area of the Darien Channel in Panama, burning a group of what they call hermaphrodites, but that were also labeled as, as sodomites. And I think that, can you go back actually? So I think this kind of you know, image here, which is of course an image of violence, it's, it's an image of death, is also intensely sexual in the ways that we have come to think of this relationship. And I think that's something that Tom of Finland will very much develop later, is how these images of, of group sexuality, of, um, of um, these orgies, these orgiastic scenes, are also acts that are very much influenced by, by a kind of act of erasure and, and repression. So. In, in thinking of that, I was looking at some of can you move? Um, Tom, Tom's work and just wanted to kind of, in a didactic and somehow forced way, uh, create the relationship between the previous image and this one. And, and see how there is, of course, an act of, an erotic act of uh, projection of, of pleasure, um, of, of orgasm and such. But at the same time, we have to think of the ways in which these bodies were named, they have been marked, as deviant, unnatural, um, abnormal, aberrant, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, forcing them into a relationship that is, in my opinion, completely, completely violent. And I think that that is something that he's going to uh, appropriate later on when he uses these uh, um, the types um, of um, um, figures of authority and turns them into these, these um, you know, agents of, of pleasure. Can you move on to the next one? So you, you, know, you, you, you start seeing the figure of the cop, the figure of the, of the sailor, the, all, of these, all of these figures that traditionally were the ones that were um, uh, affecting acts of um, discrimination and repression uh, based on sexuality. Then I, I had an encounter with uh, Peter Berlin, whose picture here in San Francisco it was uh, a really interesting time. I met him, probably he was in his mid-70s. I actually lost track of him. I don't know if, if Peter Berlin is still alive today or not, but he is? I think he is still he is. alive, yeah. But, uh, so I had a conversation with him that was very uh, illuminating to the, the points that I want to make, um, in which he was um, talking about how his body and his project, his life project, which was this kind of showing off in public, but also the films and the things that he made um, as pornography, uh, were acts that, um, that defy the, the kind of secrecy of, of the, the other places of encounter. So for him, it was like about showing off, being outside, being in cruising, in cruising spots, um, exposing his body, but never really uh, engaging in a sexual act. Always being an, an object of desire, something that was to be consumed by the people that were navigating those same spaces, but never really engaging in the, the act. And that's a question I asked him. And I said, like, is that why you're still alive? And he said, precisely. Because nobody ever touched me, so I had no, you know, I had no risk of contracting HIV. Uh, and in that sense, I think that something that becomes also very clear in, in um, Tom of Finland's work is this idea of the gay body and the muscular gay body and the kind of over-exoticized uh, body as, um, as something that is, um, uh, and youth and, you know, the, the, the kind of productive idea of the, of the healthy um, body that only produces desire, which is the gay body is something that can only produce desire. It's, it's actually a body that it's, that it's meant to be outside producing desire, engaging in desire, uh, and nothing else. And so at some point, at, towards the end of our dinner, he said, like, why are you here? Why are you not in the park? 
you know, uh, enjoying what you have, which is youth and beauty and, and all of those things. So I think that there is also that, there is another violence to that, how Tom of Finland's work is, you know, produces uh, this kind of arousal on the one hand, but at the same time reinforces this idea of a, of a kind of body that is dominated by youth and, and, and uh, the stereotype of, of, uh, of sexuality as something that, that becomes its only reason for being. Uh, and actually, as an as um, anecdote, I've, uh, Peter Berlin commissioned Tom of Finland to do some drawings of, of himself. So I think there's a, a really nice kind of t twisted relationship between Peter Berlin obviously having been influenced by Tom of Finland's drawing, but, and then becoming himself a part of those drawings. And this is actually a, a note that uh, um, a, a friend of mine, Pat Scarlett, he's a, a big uh, f fan of uh, Peter Berlin. So I managed to get an autograph for him, and I thought it would be nice to show it to you. Because he says that, uh, can you go back for a second? He says, uh, you know, uh, I ho hope and I have given you a lot of good times and lustful thoughts, which is. <laughs> and then the last thing I wanted to, do, to talk about was this idea of um, uh, the, the kind of iconographic violence that is uh, present in, in, in Tom of Finland's character and the ways that they actually manifested in real life. So again, again there's not, not only village people, but so much of the King community has embodied those drawings, right? It's, uh, when you look at the early drawings at Artist Space of 1949, you of course see that there is, of course, nothing like this out in the world. He is imagining something that we have later on very much embodied and, and, and turned into a, a reality uh, of desire and enacting that desire. Um, and I myself have been a practitioner of kink and SNM things for a long time, and, um, and I've always navigated that space where I feel that, you know, I want to avoid the, the, the symbol of the uniform and the chain and so on of its reference in the world but sometimes you have to deal with what it actually does out in the world. So an anecdote I wanted to share is one day a guy that I was playing with, which was a, a sort of master type, invited me to, to see a concert at Avery Fisher Hall. And he said, we can only go if you go on a leash. And I said, yeah, why not? So I went to uh, on a leash. And, um, and I sat and we saw uh, Verdi's Requiem on a leash. And so, and then on the, you know, which was all fun and, you know, I had a laugh and so on, but then as we were going out, somebody approached me and made a reference to Abu Ghraib. Said like, why are you, like, so there was no sexual reference. The reference for that person was so specifically about that other form of subjection, which I think is so interesting because, can you move, Harry? In, in that sense, you know, we, we embody, this is somebody I have been chatting with, and we, we kind of embody these roles this person is sending me these photographs, kind of, um, you know, uh, creating a, a great deal of arousal and so on, speaking about how this person is very interested in immigrants and people of color. Can you move to the next one? So it becomes like more graphic and more Tom of Finland esque. Uh, so I, ex I explain myself, I am, I am myself somebody from South America. There's, of course, a uh, and, and uh, a reference to that, that Latinicity in my name, what not, the next one, please, sorry. The next one. So he's like uh, exposing all of this incredible uh, desire for this exotic other that I am sexually. And then lastly, he sends this photograph. And I'm like, you know, at the peak of my excitement when I actually noticed that he is wearing a swastika in his arm. So I'm like, I'm like saying like this guy, a gay guy, Latin guy, immigrant, but then he sends me. So there, is this in, there was this inherent contradiction that just, I mean, it was a complete turn off for me immediately. I didn't chat with this person again. But then it also made me think of how can we view these roles, but also uh, Tom of Finland's characters without thinking about those contradictions uh, and about the violence that they enact. And perhaps the way that that, that uh, um, erotic relationship that we have with them is actually perhaps a very twisted psychological way of dealing with the ideas of victim of, and victimizer. So I think that thinking about Tom of Finland's work along those lines is something that we also need to do. That's it, thank you. What? 
Uh, uh, Collier Shore. He just said top that. I know. But you know. Bad <laughs> choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm a power bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Collier just top all of us. <laughs> I could have, but I was a little lazy, so. <laughs> No, I was kind of thinking, you know, why am I here? No, I just mean, you know, why am I here? What's my role in this constituency of men? Bob. I actually didn't put the panel together. But I think I know. <laughs> but I think I know why you're here. Because it's... And picking up from where what Carlos was just saying, you know, all of a sudden there's this image, there's a uniform, there's a symbol on the, you know, there are definitely photographs I think that you've made that probably are problematic for certain people because they seem to fetishize a certain kind of military yes. uniform. Yes. Uh, that's just a shot in the dark. No, it's definitely about the boots. Um, and I was thinking when I when I went and saw the show. The, the more uptown show, thinking about the boots and the uniform and the kind of, the ways in which you borrow from culture and translate it into your desire, but it's so often appropriated. Um, you know, there's, there's the guy who's a Nazi and who's having sex in World War II. And then there's the people that like pictures of Nazis and the people that wear uniforms and the people that have sex and think about Nazis. And you know, all of that kind of travels really far from what potentially was once an original, original source. Um, so I, I actually, you know, I haven't spent that much time around Dick. Um, and actually, this guy, Joey Amori, I would say that's the longest amount of time I've spent with Dick, which is this guy who's hard for about four hours. And are these, your photos? these are my photos, yeah. In? In Honcho Magazine. <coughs> um, so I was commissioned to, to do a story after, I think I had gotten a copy that had Wolfgang Tillman's pictures. Yeah, that was a period in the magazine where they, they were had collaborating an with uh, yeah. artists, Wolfgang Tillman's, yourself. I think Richard Kern. Yeah, a bunch of Bruce. A bunch of, Bruce. Yeah, Bruce yeah. is actually in this, and so they kind of, uh, you know, assigned me a, a kid who they thought fit fit the build for me, and his name, his poor name was Joey Amori, and he went to NYU, and I, you know, decided to do a a story about a soldier, you know, who's horny, um, because I think yeah, sure. Because I, I thought, well, that's what, that's the porn I had read. The, the scant kind of um, pieces of gay porn were always sort of involving sailors and soldiers and pickups and, you know, thinking back to Gore Vidal's City in the Pillar and, you know, boys just kind of trawling around. So I took this guy to an apartment and, sure, it's not that long of a story, but, uh, and he didn't have that big of a dick, but... <laughs> There are ways that you shoot it from below <laughs> that make it bigger. Um, so he was, he was a little bit shy, I think, because he knew that it was uh, unfamiliar terrain for me. And he, afraid that he wouldn't get an erection for the required amount of photographs, he brought a videotape with him to watch. And I realized that he was watching a videotape that he was in. <laughs> getting fucked on a pool table by two guys in overalls. And so the whole time he was kind of jerking off and, you know, never coming, of course. Um, but, but we went through this kind of ritual of, of trying to figure out, you know, what meant what and doing an ass shot and doing the shot from below and how much, you know, how, how, how many ways that you could move the dick to make it look different than the picture before. Um, and there were things that, you know, there were problems. The, the biggest problem was he had pierced nipples. And so that was just like a dead giveaway that it was fake. And that was kind of a bummer for me. Um, 
and but but I thought about things like black socks and you know shoes and and all these things and it and it was so curious because all of it was totally unfamiliar. It was just things I had gleaned from fiction I had read that taught me how to be gay before I could access things by women about being gay. So essentially I was I was raised as a gay guy by the culture that was available. Um, yeah. Was, does this shoot come before certain pictures that you made that seemed to be set, let's say, in like the 1940s in Europe? I think, I think it comes... Or came after? I think it came like as I was just starting to make those pictures because I had the military uniforms. You know, I had the GI things. Um, so we did this shoot two times because, of course, being an artist, you know, it's not just that one porn shoot. You want to get a show out of it or something. So, um, you know, and you want to get more. Like, uh, you know, it was the only dick that was seemingly available. And, um, and it was free. So we, we dressed both as soldiers in standard GI dress uniform. And we went to the Intrepid. <laughs> and we went you know, on deck, and I started staging little pictures. I had him reading a Lenny Bruce book, which I have no idea why, but somehow it seemed to make sense. And then he took his dick out and started kind of jerking off. And I went behind him and I kind of took him like, you know, I was a fellow soldier, fuck him in the ass. And just as I was doing that, the police came. <laughs> and, uh, Did you get them in the photograph? I have a, no, no, the police, no. Because that would have been like a Tom of Finland picture, right? No, no, I was just, you know. First of all, I was in an army uniform, head to toe. And I, you know, I was with a 20 year old and, but the amazing thing was, and we were shooting video, my assistant was there and she was shooting video of this. And she didn't realize that there was a piece of railing that went across his crotch. So when they took us down to the basement to look at this video, you couldn't see the dick. So we were saved, but we almost went to prison. And, um, and that was the last pornography I ever made. But every time I pass the Intrepid, I think about how adventurous I once was. Um, you started by asking why you were here. Um, did you... I, I imagine you would have seen Tom of Finland somewhere along the line. Uh, at I some think point. I probably saw it, you know, on a calendar in a bookstore. Yeah. Like, I feel like that's how. I don't think I saw it in any kind of illicit way. You know, like the first time I really read hardcore gay material was Straight to Hell zine. Um, maybe there was a drawing in there, but. Um, you know, for me, the, the Tom of Finland thing was so, uh, first of all, nostalgic in a way that, that I couldn't relate to. And also, like, you know, for someone who wasn't a gay boy but, like, went to Christopher Street, went to All-American Boy, you know, wore 501s, you know, I was barely passing. And so to look at those pictures was, like, you know, a complete reminder of like that being a separate world and, and not necessarily, you know, an accommodating world. So, um, you know, I was, I was attracted to the real thing. I would be much more interested in standing outside boots and saddles, you know, and watching some like, you know, queen, you know, leather queen coming down the street. To me, the real thing is the interesting thing. And a real big dick is a real big dick but like a drawing of a big dick, it's not really a big dick, you know? And, and not having any dick at all, that's just me, that's just me. That's a tragedy, it is a tragedy, yes. <laughs> it's a total, it's a total tragedy. Um. You know, I wanted to pick up on something, um, Carlos, that you were saying. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, Peter Berlin presenting an image to the world, but not, you know, like, look, but don't touch, right? So he was actually this 
living, walking representation. So then wanting Tom of Finland to make a drawing of him, to make a representation of this kind of, you know, life size for real, uh, in a sense, he objectified himself as a representation. And adding to that, the idea where you, I think you were saying that this world kind of exists in these drawings, even if real life, as you say, is better. But the, the world existed in these drawings, in a sense, before it existed. It becomes a kind of actualization become of, because of them. So yeah, real is better than drawing. It's just a pencil or whatever. But at the same time, that actualizing of something is that's the power of that work. And you also were saying, anyone jump in anytime, because I'll just keep going. You also said that uh, it was nostalgic. And I think, you know, you look at drawings, and one of the great things about the Artist Space show is there's very early drawings. And you can see, like, that's the 1940s, that's the 50s, that's the 60s. It's a very interesting way of marking time, you know, through these images. That's the 70s, and then they get these 70s mustaches, things like that. That's the 80s, etc. Um, but what they represent, ultimately, the desire and so on, people will always respond to that. So even if you can say, and I can't deny it, that it's... Uh, nostalgic, well, you know, it's somehow always going to be alive for anyone who encounters it for the first time. I, I think it's, it's also what you're, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, for a lot of gay men, that's their diary of Anne Frank, you know? Like, every, every, every Jewish girl has to read Diary of Anne Frank, right? And, you know, you, 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 you kind of you see yourself in a character, even if that character is from another time period. So I, you know, I'm also like, what, what was really interesting for me was seeing the show upstairs, which I didn't see until today. I didn't realize there was two shows. So yesterday I just, I just saw the, the drawing show and, you know, had certain thoughts. And then coming and seeing this, you know, my, my excitement over the power of photography um, you know, and, and the collage and the way in which he didn't author the images, but authored the collecting of the images. Um, you know, and, and it reminded me of uh, Renaud Camus' book, Tricks, and just like this collection of, you know, different kinds of icons of a sexual Which is also encounter. upstairs. Is that book upstairs? It's on the shelf, yeah. Oh. Um, maybe, I, I mean, I can just say something about that, Bob, which is that Tom really consciously made those drawings in a utopian mindset. Like one of the things that he said to me was that it was very important to him that he drew men having a good time. Um, and that even though there is, even though there's bondage in the drawings, even though there's whipping in the drawings, even though there's um, there's um, forced sex in the drawings. In his mind, it was it. He wanted to make sure that there would be a drawing in the sequence where the people involved were having a good time, because that was not out there in the world. That basically the consequences of being publicly seen as queer were the sort of violent erasure that you're talking about, and. And so um, they do have a, they, they are, um, they're utopian in intent. But the thing is that anybody's utopia is, is always going to be severely limited. And, and he does have real blind spots. He can't draw women. Like he has no, he, he's like, the drawings of women's bodies are like ludicrous. Well, there's that, there's that one woman towards the back, which is my favorite picture. And I couldn't tell if it was like, it was a man's face when she's holding. No, 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 she is. Yeah, and I mean, it, that's the and thing. It, and I thought like, oh my God, it's, it's amazing. It's like, it was the first moment of arousal I had in the entire show. Uh -huh. Because, and it wasn't necessarily because it was my gender. It was just that, it was a different organ, yeah. and so it seemed exotic. Yeah, you know, in the face of what by the end of the show, it's like it's it's a kind of 
as though just there's only men and they're frolicking around and by the time you get to the end of it, you're like, okay, so they, here they are. And yeah. then this woman comes in, but she has a man's face. Yeah, and, and a man's build. I mean, her yeah. shoulders are really wide. And, um, and uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that he was also acutely aware of the sort of, that, that his visual sensibilities and his sexual sensibilities were really honed in a kind of mid-century fascism. And, um, and, and he took the, um, the drawings that he had made that had Nazi, that had swastikas in them and had Nazi imagery in them out of circulation um, quite deliberately. It was a thing that ended up, that, that um, you know, his initial erotic attraction to those men was in a kind of fucked up psychological place of like we're being occupied like like I'm part of this population that's being occupied by this controlling force and sort of eroticizing authority there um, but then as time went on and those things started to like when people would sort of approach him about like the hotness of Nazism he was like no it's not like it's not hot. I mean, that, that's interesting for me because I, you know, I definitely kind of, you know, battled with that. And it's, it's and, really and, there. And, and kind of, you know, decided that the, you know, the, the masochism in my pictures was that the people wearing the uniforms had such a traumatic relationship to it, that there was a kind of, yeah. you know, an S&M relationship between me and them. But I think, you know, the other thing about looking at someone like Tom of Finland's work is that it was made not necessarily in a conversation with the art world at large. At all. So there was, it's not like he had five goals and one of them was to get off, but two of them were to kind of take down another kind of group of art or to, you know, change the institution. So it's like, you know, I think that the difficulty sometimes is you look at the work and you, you call it the work. And in fact, it, you know, it functioned in a different way when it was made. Um, and so the parts of it that, you know, it was, it was really a kind of <clears throat> public service for, you know, a discrete community. And it was his version of what that community could look like. Yeah. M maybe a, a second part for this show, Stefan, could be a, a two-person show, Tom of Finland, Henry Darger. Because I, I couldn't stop thinking of Henry Darger in a way, because there's like this kind of really uh, kind of outsider trying to build up a, a, a utopian space. And I, I was curious to know, you know, I, I could see what he was looking at here, but what would Hen Henry Darger would be looking at in his own space? Uh, but that is to say that the, 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 um, the show up here is actually very instructive to think about the resources we have to build those utopian spaces. You know, the, we are very limited in relationship to our own political and, and experiential uh, life in, uh, in relationship to what goes on around us to construct that utopian space. Um, and that utopian space is incredibly fucked up, but I, I actually don't think, uh, Nayland, that you can separate it from Nazism at all because it's a completely Aryan universe. You know, if you speak about race, for instance, there are two or, th you know, I don't know how many exactly, but there are in this show perhaps maybe four black figures in all of the drawings, but they are really just kind of like colored white men, you know? So that's, that's just to think about that, that um, you know, the place from which we draw to construct these spaces is something we have to think about as well. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't want to present him as some, like, exemplary figure who should only be emulated and, and that there aren't, parts of that visual and conceptual legacy that aren't very, very problematic. But I, but I do think it's helpful to think about it, particularly in the way that Collier, that, that you were talking about, that this, um, that, that what we do with what we have and where those things were directed, they were not meant for a public wall and that is not to excuse those parts of them that draw upon fascist imagery and fascist experience and eroticize that, but it's really important to remember that, that like those things weren't, you know, they might have been meant for publication, 
but publication meant a very different thing in 1950 than it did. Uh, yeah, I, I, this kind of is becoming kind of a whole subtopic, and un, honestly, I feel that, you know, if you go upstairs and you watch the video, it's very short, and it's Tom of Finland at the invitation of Mike Kelly speaking at CalArts. And, uh, you know, it's not a big lecture. It's, he's, there's only a few people there. I think it's just in his class. And, uh, you know, one thing that comes across is this relationship to boots and uniforms, things like that. Um, you know, you have to remember that he comes from a very particular time and place. So, I mean, even things like the boots just come from fishermen and farmer, you know, before the military. But also, you know, it's, he's in an occupied country, it's a historical moment. You know, if Tom of Finland is born 10 years later, he's maybe not making any of, you know, references to any of that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's what he grew up with. And even in that interview, um, he says, that the, f what does he say? He says that it was the Germans who kind of came to Finland to protect them from a Russian occupation and invasion. So he, you know, as a young person is not seeing them initially as these are the invaders and these are the bad guys. They were, he says it, that they were saving Finland from the Russians. Um, but if you, you know, if you place him 10 years later, there's probably all sorts of drawings that don't exist. And in fact, um, I don't even know to what extent they're really, like what's the percentage of that representation in his body of work. Also, because it's a, as I was saying before, it's a large body of work that covers, spans decades. Well, also the, and everything the changes Nazi too when he comes to America and he lives in Los Angeles. The Nazis morph into motorcycle cops. Yeah, you know, right. so the whole and, and that's the that, U.S. That's, motorcycle that, cops. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing that it, it is. I'm not sure who said it here, but it's like you know, there's a basic uniform, and yeah. and and it changes, but it doesn't change that much. And so, you know, when you see people, kind of, you know, wearing fashion, it, it's just like the collar, the change of you know, rounding of a collar connotes one thing and the sharp edge of a motorcycle jacket is another kind of uniform and different countries have different uniforms and you know it kind of becomes and that that's how like when I was making pictures in Germany you know I would I would get some uniforms from Berlin from a theater company and then I would kind of you know cheat it a bit with whatever I had and some it was like rain boots or something and you know because people basically will see what you want them to see and I think that, you know, the thing with, with authorship and, and, you know, expressing desire and sexuality is that it, it's always kind of, you know, it always involves the guilt of representation and, it, and it's never inclusive. I mean, it's just, I remember doing a, a retrospective in Germany, um, you know, with a, with a lot of kind of homemade Nazi pictures and, and my fear when I got there was that they were going to say, you know, and the show is called Neighbors, they were going to say, where are the Turkish people? <laughs> you know, and I felt really guilty about that, that I was, I was, you know, making a documentary project for 20 years in a town in Germany and the neighbors were Turkish and I didn't have any of those pictures um, because I wasn't interested and there wasn't a lot of communication. And, uh, you know, the curator was like, I don't really don't care about that. Like they didn't care, they didn't notice, um, you know. And I've I've often thought like my work is extremely white, you know. Um, it used to be extremely blonde, and and you know, and, and I was constantly kind of waiting for somebody to say, "Why is your work so white?" Um, but you know, my work is white because I'm white, and 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 I look in the mirror and I see a certain thing, and I want it to be a certain other thing, and it, you know. And I make work based on what my ideal version of myself is. So I assume that he was doing the same. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned there, there's no real representation of women in his work. And you, Nalan had brought up earlier that a lot of people saw, as I did, uh, Tom's work at Feature. Um, we have a couple <laughs> images. One of the brilliant things that happened in the 80s was that uh, the uh, G.B. Jones pictures, was that a woman appropriated the look of Tom's drawings in a series called Tom, Tom Girls. 
And this is, uh, and one is a direct appropriation. So, which is which? Okay, so we have G.B. Jones, I am a fascist pig, 1987. And you have Tom of Finland, 1964 from this series, The Motorcycle Thief. So it's women artists. This, and G.B. Jones, for people who don't know, these uh, drawings were made more or less throughout the whole 80s. And uh, she came from Toronto and more or less with Bruce LaBruce jump started what they called uh, homo core. Um, but I find that, you know, if you think about people, artists influenced by Tom, it's kind of the one very direct uh, parallel relationship. Plus the fact that they were shown in the same gallery and, uh, and Hudson did a show pairing their, their works. I don't know how, if you're a fan I, of or familiar with G.B. Jones. Well, you know, I'm not like a cartoon person, to be honest. <laughs> I know, it sounds terrible, but... Okay, next. Uh, yeah. But you, you're familiar, Neilan. Yeah. I, I don't know, what did you think when you saw that, that it was something that shouldn't have been done, or you thought it was... Uh, I'm, I mean, there... An interesting kind of taking over of another sort of I, It's hard for me to divorce these drawings from the whole sort of JD's, so the whole sort of emergent JD's queer was the zine, zine right. where a lot of these reproduced right. JD's so there, standing for juvenile delinquents, Right, so there was a, a sort of like emerging queer zine scene through the mid 80s and into the early 90s. And I think one of the things that was certainly exciting about that and exciting about seeing, for, you know, first seeing these that's where I first saw these these drawings of GBs was that, you know, like the situation with Physique Pictorial, here was a place where it seemed like there was a community that was speaking to each other back and forth through these kind of publications that were not mainstream publications, that were, that it was something that was not functioning within the art world. Um, and and uh, and was actually more of a kind of cultural exchange among cities and among a whole sort of generation of artists who I think were looking at the same thing. You know, if you think about John Lindell here was doing work that was based, you know, was using parts of Tom drawings, and there were a lot of people here and on the West Coast and in various places that were looking at all, sort of all of this material. And in part, I think it was fueled by a kind of nostalgia. Um, and, and you could say that it was also a generational split that was really about people distancing themselves from the AIDS generation. For the most part, these were people who, for whom the sort of in, mainstream institutions of gay life as they'd been sort of formulated in the in the early you know early 70s were just that they were institutions and people were much more connected to to punk than necessarily like the sort of mainstream gay idea and so these drawings were exciting to me just because they were part of that like um, engagement with and, and chewing up and reworking of these things that were happening in all, in all of these different places. One of the things that G.B. Jones does, and I don't have really other images and they're all very bad quality, sorry about yeah. that, but one of the things that you find in G.B. Jones' work, it's not just a translation from male to female, but she does something that Tom doesn't do, which is she, and be, I think it's because she's coming out of punk and in that time period, she's really upending the authority figures. And that's, I think, her contribution. It's not just, you know, anyone can make an appropriation of something that's yeah. cool. Yeah. What, about, what about Nicole Eisman? Like, it just, it just reminded me of, like, the early, yeah. like, seeing the early yeah. drawings of hers and, and kind of, like, you know, maybe that was an easier way for me to kind of relate to this appropriation of, you know, because there was a lot of kind of fucking yeah. and you know, group sex yeah. and orgies and kind of just general dirtiness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think yeah. Nicole was, I mean, that was definitely felt, felt very much in that period and somebody else who I would say is a real sort of inheritor of, of 
that, you know, sort of that, that same visual vocabulary. And it's funny because I think that she, you know, if you look at the evolution of her work, it definitely went from, you know, kind of Duncan Grant, Paul Cadmus, uh, but now it's like in Bazlitt's territory. And I think she looks at that older work as a kind of, you know, almost a, a, a youthful sketchbook of stuff, um, which she just mentioned it recently. And I was sort of intrigued in the way in which, you know, she talked about the fact that she was like learning to paint in front of, you know, in public. And mm -hmm. Carlos, you were talking about, did you have something to say? Yeah, yeah I just wanted to, because. Um, I noticed as I was seeing the show the absence of something else in Tom of Finland's drawings, which I found really interesting, which is the asshole. Because it's all about the dick, but there is not really... Always. Not always. Not always, I know, I but, but for the most part, it is about the dick, and there are very few instances where the asshole, you know, the, the actual asshole is depicted. And I was thinking what, you know, we live in a completely asphobic culture, and I think especially when he's thinking, uh, writing, um, drawing, rather, um, the asshole is something that is, of course, the, a, a territory that is completely uh, represents vulnerability and, and uh, to be a man you have to have a dick and you have to have a big dick and so on. But this idea of, of the absence of the ass and the absence of uh, the actual act of sodomy being literally depicted, I think it's really significant uh, and indicative of the ways in which the work also influence our thinking around what a queer identity or a gay identity is and the politics of gayness that were formed um, around those kinds of representations. Uh, we still can't speak about asses in culture. I mean, we're obsessed with the, with the chicks, but never with the actual rectum. But in, in a way, it's, it's you know, and I, maybe nostalgic is, is the wrong word. You know, maybe for me, it was ultimately too sweet, you know, that it was ultimately too cheerful to, to really have an impact on me as, yeah. as an artist. Yeah, yeah. but, there, it's, but very, think, it's very clean. But going he back is to like, that he utopian is, idea. He is a very, very clean artist. The pen, like the pencil rendering is really polished. It's not about dirt, right? And it's about a kind of coherence, which is why I think it appeals to a certain kind of person who is like, and Peter Berlin is like, a, it's great that you brought that in because um, for him it's all about, this is about cohering. This is about a, being a sort of complete surface that does not uh, permit a kind of entry. Um, and, and, and I think that that's, you know, people often I think fall on one spectrum or the other of, of whether or not they value coherence or value incoherence. And, and Tom is definitely, it's about coherence. Well, it may not personally, you know. Don't pick on me. I, you know. You are, you're, you're seething over there. I'm not seething. You know. If I was seething, you'd know. What, ask me a question. I'm not gonna ask a question. I wanna, what I wanna say that I, I feel like no one's really said uh, until now is something that's really, really important to this work. Because even if you can say it's, so I'm not picking up, you said nostalgic, and then just a minute ago you said cheerful, and you know, um, there's something really important that he contributes. And I don't even mean to art, I mean to kind of like human beings, which is there's ultimately a message to his work. And he's basically saying, you know, because it's a very repressive world he came out of. Everything was forbidden at that time and so on. And, you know, in parts of the world today, 2015, it's, they'll kill you, you know. Uh, they'll hang you or they'll, whatever they'll do, throw you in jail. But his message, and you don't get this in a lot of art, he's basically, and it's one of the reasons why I think someone like a Mike Kelly uh, relates to it. There's this underlying message all the way through, and he's saying, you know, okay, you're repressed. This is how you repress your repression. It's a major statement. So the drawings look the way they look, but the statement is going to register the way it does, and it'll. Oh, I think it always will. Wait, can you can you just clarify that? No. You 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 think the work represses repression, and that that's one of the big messages of that work, which I think is an important message, and always has been, and always will be. Is that a message though? Yeah. Like a message in a bottle. A what? 
Maybe we should have questions because I think there's probably like so many informed, fascinating people in this audience, and we should give them a chance. Somebody way in the back. Wait. Jeez. It's been really interesting so far, especially when you spoke about it from the very beginning, about it being pornography. And I think one of the things that you just has to be accepted is we like what we like. So like at any given time, what we like, especially sexually and internally, like rarely would anybody say like, what is your darkest, most extreme sexual fantasy and be upfront about it but he was willing to do that. And you could see it's informed by the time frame. And you can also see how pornography has actually shifted over in time, informed by the politics. So I think the absence sometimes of people of color or whatever, it's all just part of the temporal existence of the work. And particularly when you were talking about things could be preserved by an iPhone, you can't really preserve the psyche of any given time period, and that's why it's interesting. I think the, I think the thing that uh, I'm taking away though from this is, it it stands as pornography first. Dirk's motivation, he made a movie called The Wild Ones, which is like the only like porno that tried to bring Tom of Finland's work to life. And so like I think it's always great to talk about it because he was an incredible artist. And it's not lessened by it being pornography, but just like, I'm sure everybody in here has certain kink that they wouldn't want to tell anyone about specifically. You know, and I guess being raised in the generation that never thought there would be marriage or any of those things, I'm used to the idea of being gay as being outlaw, you know, and that's part of what the work is about. And now it's morphed, you know, so I think though it was an amazing panel, thanks. I think you got somebody. Oh, um, so this, this isn't a question. I just wanted to riff on the G.B. Jones piece. So um, I think some significant, a couple of pieces. I mean, one is I think these are done in 1987, I see. So this is the era, the same era as like Pat Califia's Macho Sluts came out. Um, this is just a little bit before Kathy Opie's um, being and you know, the ones with like the drag kings and as well as cutting was just a few years before that. Um, so I think this is really an era where women are trying to claim a more um, assertive sexuality, a more fetishistic sexuality. I think that's also very largely in response to like a feminist, lesbian, sort of less fetishistic <laughs> um, sexuality. Also, the significance of G.B. Jones being Canadian in particular. There was a lot going on in Canada right then around Andrea Dworkin, um, a lot of censorship around gay bookstores that stemmed from her, um, her politics around intercourse as a violent act, and that was trickling down and affecting gay bookstores, censoring gay bookstores, uh, and imagery. So the fact that G.B. Jones was from Toronto and was doing this like totally hardcore or leaning towards hard, hardcore sexuality, claiming it for women, playing with it, uh, distributing it through zines. And I, I, I was in Montreal at the, at, during those years and just having her work and um, uh, JD's and the Homocore movement come into those feminist bookstores and inject that kind of energy and sexuality was totally down, uh, groundbreaking and uh, was really exciting at that time. So I just wanted to add those observations. That's all. Mm -hmm. uh, one second. Uh, Harry, can you put an, one last image up just because I think it picks up on that and some things that have been said. It's the last one from the uh, circus or carnival, the test your strength. I think this also speaks to a lot of the things going on in Tom's work and what the person in the audience was just saying is, and again, I 
can't really clarify it as a message. It's right there as a sign. Test, test your strength. I have a feeling that his representation of these men with these bodies, and even as Carlos was saying, acts of violence, etc. It's a whole period where a lot of people began to, you know, instead of like cowering and also representations, let's say, of more, uh, you know, like kind of the limp-wristed cliche of the, he's basically saying, and that to me is a very political thing, even though Tom never thinks of himself or until later as a political artist, he's saying test your strength. And that's another kind of message that I think comes through and involves some of what's maybe problematic about the violence. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole, you know, the whole West Village clones, um, you know, and the piers and, and all that cruising stuff was about, you know, given a choice, you would rather look like the oppressor than the oppressed. And so, you know, that's a, that's a political statement, you know, and that's a kind of, I think the thing that, that I find, you know, ultimately still interesting is how much of this, you know, art product made by histories of gay people uh, looks and talks about certain things because of the oppression that existed. And, and what is that cultural property once that oppression doesn't exist? And how, you know, it, so is it, is it sort of, it, is this a sexuality or is this a reaction to not having a permissible sexuality? And is this it, it or it's entwined? Yeah, Absolutely. or it's entwined. But it, you know, I think we, you know, I, I mean, me, you know, as a woman and a lesbian, you know, I I can't always separate how you know, given a you know, with a with a a piece of sex cheese at the end of a maze, if you put a straight mouse and a gay mouse, male, would they run the same way towards that cheese? Would they eat that cheese the same way? If, you know, is this all men are like this or just gay men who are in the closet are like this? You know, it, it, it's, it's all a mystery to me. I think there's some other questions around. Uh, so as Tom continued drawing, uh, there was, uh, he started to draw more non-white men. And uh, I wondered if you, anyone on the floor, you on the panel, if you had any reaction to the artist base deciding not to show that, or did you, did that even like cross your mind? Did that hit you, affect you? I mean, I am, I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious about like the selection for the show. I don't, and, and, but I, I'm not intimate with like what the, what got pulled for it. So I don't, I don't know the reason for it. I, and you're right that they're, um, and, and he quite specifically put together like some collections of um, African-American men. I mean, there, again, there's a, there's, you know, a, a, similar difficulty there, right? Because he's primarily working from, occasionally he's got models, but op, more often than not, he's working from photographs. And they're photographs that he's kind of self-selected, as you can see up there, for the thing that's interesting to him. So they, I mean, I think as, as Carter says, they're not, it's, it's not about a kind of reality. I think that he, understood a value of inclusion, but he's also like a European guy from the 30s, right? Who's, there are, there, there are, you know, parts of that, I mean, there's, there's, there's cliche that enters into his depiction of black men, you know, I think. Um, and so it's weird to, like, try to parse that out, you know? So are you saying that, I mean, just to, to kind of understand the, are you saying that the representations of black men might seem offensive in his work and therefore exhibiting them would sort of be kind of, uh, you know, would maybe lend some other criticism? Like, is that what, because I'm I, curious I don't know. what I mean, we're talking maybe that, about. Maybe that's, the, maybe that's the case. Maybe that was what the, was behind the decision. I don't know. I just know that 
there are those drawings and um, I, I think of that more in the latter drawings because I actually in the drawings from the 60s that's actually not the case that they don't feel too cartoony or caricatured to me in fact I, I mean I own a, a drawing that has uh, an African-American man in it at the center of it and it's a very sort of straight ahead knowing, representation. Uh, knowing his work, it was when you came to the end of the show, did you think that, did you think, oh, this is predominantly white or? I, I, I thought that it was cut, I mean, I thought that the whole thing was kind of cut down and that there were, uh, there were a few things that, are, that I hadn't seen, yeah. but I didn't really it like didn't go through it. like, okay, why this edit? So, yeah. you know, thank you for bringing it up. I think it's yeah. a good question. Yeah, I just wanted an uh, honest reaction. It's like, did it cross your mind? Like, uh, knowing his work, knowing him, knowing that he was drawing a sort of utopia mm -hmm. and that then how it's uh, portrayed here is uh, a specific way. If, uh, it crossed my mind, but you yeah. know, I mean, it's fucked up to begin with, so. Yeah. I don't even know if utopia is exactly the right word because and I'm going back to that um, talk he gave in Mike Kelly's class. There's a word he uses that comes up so many times, over and over and over. And of course, he's not an English major, but he's, it's pretty good. But it comes up again and again and again, and the word is fantasy. And he's depicting his fantasy world. I don't think he's thinking about any, who's thinking about someone else's fan, the nature of fantasy is that it's private and it's yours. And it's, the, a re, it's all representations of his fantasy. The other thing I want to mention is, you know, his job for many years was in advertising, one of the first big global advertising agencies he was working for in Finland. And when you look at the source material, and as with a lot of artists, the source material really, this is how you can, these are all the doorways or pathways into that person's world, you know, in visual world. And, you know, he's cutting out by days working for the advertising agency and at night he's cutting pictures out of magazines and papers and things. And, you know, I mean, I remember growing up, the, when you look at advertising, mainstream advertising and so on, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, the people in the ads are white. Up there in the, in the, in the collages, you, I, I saw a couple of times uh, Muhammad Ali, and those are obviously from newspapers. Um, but I really have to come back to him representing his fantasy world. He's not interested in anyone else's it, fantasy. I, I think it, it's I mean, also the Huckleberry Finn problem, right? I mean, it's like the problem of like, when you're from a certain generation, your experience and your translations of the other, you know, are, are in keeping with what, what your education is. And, and also in, in the video, there is a moment when that fantasy space is broken as he speaks about the need to having to uh, depict a condom. Right. Which I thought it was also really interesting. It's a moment when he, you know, everything is kind of shut down and he says, and AIDS is happening, so I, you know, yeah. now I do this. Yeah, and I, I, I actually would push back on that a bit, Bob, because I, I think that he, um, at the point that he's like, you know, like that, Mike is having a Macal Arts and, and, and at the point that he's working with Dirk and in the foundation and the work is starting to achieve a greater and greater prominence, sort of right before the Tashin, you know, books, he understood that he had a role in, uh, it, as a maker of depictions that, uh, that many people responded to. And so I think his attempts to incorporate, um, uh, different types of men, um, men from more diverse backgrounds, and to actually acknowledge um, the realities of the AIDS crisis, the, it, it wasn't purely fantasy at that point. You know, um, it, it was, he understood that that was happening in dialogue with a community. Um, it's more or less last 10 years of his life. Yeah, so I, I, I think that there's, that, that's why I, I also am, I, I, I think the Darger case is interesting, in part because people can do so much with Darger because he's not around to say anything. Right. Whereas, you know, Tom was an alive, articulate, non-naive 
like sophisticated person <laughs> who uh, understood like the impact of the things that he was doing and and I think that he's not an outsider artist in that sense but it's often tempting for us to sort of hope that he is because then we can spin out our own sort of theories about what he was thinking or what he wasn't thinking or what his deficiencies were or what his successes were or, you know in the absence of any other sort of evidence but I, that's not really the case with him are there any like one or two more questions? Um, somebody's over on the front side and someone's in the back. Uh, yes, um, I was actually interested in how, because there's so many parallels you see in other people's work like um, Paul Cadmus or Jared French and Kenneth Anger even, and also there's this artist named Samuel Stewart. Um, did they know each other? I mean, was there, did, did Tom of Finland actually personally know these people or or was it just through underground sort of systems of, of, of dispersion that they sort of were aware of that style or um, Tom certainly knew about Cadmus and and uh, French uh, but you know he saw what he was doing is very very different from from those two um, I don't know if he knew Sam Stewart. He might have because there was a connection through the Chicago leather scene. Um, but um, they probably were aware of each other, but I don't know how much they, they knew of each other. He was more connected with people like Bob Meisner and the people who were, do, who were doing physique photography more than necessarily um, other sort of mainstream artists around that. And what about Kenneth Anger? Um, I don't think he knew Anger at all. Oh, okay. There's someone up front. Uh, I was just thinking about the question that uh, when did you first encounter his work and um, we, everyone's spoken about dissemination a bit and uh, underground networks of um, distribution. And my first memory of the Tom Finland book was uh, picking up the mass market copy at the bookstore that I worked covered in cum that people brought into the bathroom. <laughs> but more recently, I can just like pick up my phone and literally like type it in and I'll access it. And um, I just wonder, I feel like pornography and erotic images in general pervade spaces like the internet, certain platforms on the internet. And I just, in, in encountering the work uh, upstairs and up the street, I just was struck by the banality of it all. The fact that I've seen these images so much and that they don't have that power. They still live as pornography, but pornography has lost that edge, that danger. And um, I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on that. Uh, and uh, what that signifies for the continuation of his work uh, going on into the future and stuff as a cultural artifact. Is it, is it moving to something else away from pornography because of that mass effect? Anyways. Well, I mean, don't you think that it's also the difference between kind of erotic pictorial style and hardcore pornography? Like, if you look at you know, Maplethorpe nudes, that's one thing. And if you look at the really hardcore stuff, that's still extremely hardcore. You know, whether or not it turns you on, it's, you know, uh, I, I don't, I, it, it seems to me that, that the Tom of Finland stuff was kind of inspirational. Um, it, it doesn't, it seems like it was connected to eroticism and it was connected to like, the basic, you know, use value of pornography, but, um, yeah. I, I think if there's one thing the internet has taught us, it's that somewhere someone is jerking off to anything that you can possibly imagine. <laughs> and, and, and so I don't think pornography is going to go away, right? What the thing that like completely gave, that formed my erotic life was the 1966 Batman series, <laughs> right? And I can tell you quite specifically like how that all came down. 
And, and the truth is that everybody has their version of that thing. As we are trying to develop a you know, sexual attraction or understand what that is, we fixate on the things in our environment. So it, yes, there are, there, for many, many people now, Tom is the guy that's on the postage stamp in Finland, right? There may be some people who are ex extremely aroused by postage stamps who are jerking off to that. But, you know, for the most part, it, it, it does have a kind of banal existence. And one of the things that is problematic about him is the way that he came to represent a very particular kind of blinkered and odd segment of gay male identity. Um, but that's something that happens really separate from the individual use case of pornography. I just wanted to add, you know, you can look at all sorts of pornography that's out there now that's been produced from a certain era, etc. You can go back to Victorian times, you can go back to, okay. A lot of it could have been done by anyone. And why I think someone like we're even here and why you're doing shows and books and so on is, you know, when you see a Tom of Finland drawing, it's his drawing. It's not by anyone else, you know? It's a certain style. It's immediately identifiable. You know, it's a kind of a great achievement if you're an artist that, you know, because also we live in a world where a lot of people make art. It just looks like what other people do or what other people have done. So a Tom of Finland drawing has this kind of iconicity. Mm -hmm. And that's an, it's an achievement that uh, I think, you know, pornography that we could just go and look at on a computer today has no relationship to that kind of level of culture. Well, I'm actually not sure because if you think of like uh, contemporary porn studios like Treasure Island Media or something, it's the, the same level of, of uh, um, um, authorship. Um, that is there is, one person who directs them all? Is there one yeah, person who... Yeah, what's the name of the guy? Um, Paul Morris. Paul Morris. And, you ha and, but it's, and I think that in a way, you know, it would be interesting to think about Paul Morris in relationship to Tom of Finland because he's really articulating the, the, the erotic and sexual issues of, of, of our time. You know, he's really thinking about barebacking, uh, uh, pause versus nag, you know, what, what the role of the cum shot is nowadays in pornography when you're barebacking, right? Which is like, uh, always pornography was defined with the cum shot. That's the moment of ejaculation and so on. But if you're barebacking, you're coming inside, you don't see that. So there are all of those questions that I think are really interesting to think about in relationship to the time, because he, he was articulating that fantasy world in the 19, all of those. And now there are other people like, like um, Paul Morris that are doing it today. Um, I, I, I doubt that there would be a Paul Morris show at Artie Space anytime soon. But I think there is a, 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 an interesting level of artistry that comes to, to think, thinking about what, how sexuality is enacted and lived and conceptualized. Maybe in 50 years Artie Space will have a Paul Morris show, who knows. But there is something about that work there that, that, um, that is not, he's not, he was not only a fine artist. We may come to think of him now as a fine artist within this context that we have built around him. But he was also reflecting the needs of the time, the fantasy of the moment of gay men. I, I mean, I was, I'd also think about people like the, the people behind Crash Pad series. I mean, I see something more akin to Tom in what's going on in people who are making pornography for the trans community and, and, uh, and, and more in, the, um, in sort of the younger parts of the, the women's and gender queer community because that seems to me like a place where there's a really lively dialogue going on about body type, about what does consent mean, what the, that does not seem so top down, that seems like it's much more in, in a... Um, this is all true, but think about it, it's all recent. So it's all really, it's post Tom yeah. of Finland, it's post this whole period. Um, but now we live in a time in which you can speak about sexuality. He could not speak about sexuality. Yeah. The meeting points in the 1950s were the tea houses, mm -hmm. right, which were really the secret bathrooms where people met and so on. So there, is, there isn't that kind of, of um, the, yeah, there isn't a, there is a, it's a completely different context to think about these kind of erotic representations right. today. Well, and it also is, I mean, I know that we need to wrap up, but it also is one of the things that makes the case for a more rigid uniform, right? 
because if you're more specific about the uniform, then it gets easier to spot somebody without having to say anything, without having to put yourself at risk, right? It's well, about having a kind of visual coding that allows you um, a, a greater possibility of finding other people that are that you can connect with. Well, I think that's like you know, and I was I was looking at it. There's, you know, it's a drawing, but but even so, you look at it and you think, is that a gay person in that drawing? Um, you know, and I think that the work really skirts this this you know, it it comes really close to this line of being kind of exaggerated, heterosexual, virile looking guys, but they're so exaggerated that they become gay because their, their sexuality is just burgeoning out of them. And I think that, you know, there's something, you know, for me, like a much more influential artist would be Karl Heinz Weinberger. And I think that, you know, what was interesting was that they were mostly straight but they were willing participants in a kind of you know, gay portrait studio. Right. Um, and you could look at those pictures and kind of fantasize that they were gay. And, and that's, you know, that happens in photography at Stephen Klein's house every day, yeah. you know, where it's, it's, it's a straight boy wearing gay clothes and, yeah. and sort of looking like this. And so I, th I think there's something kind of special about the fact that it's a drawing of a gay face. Yeah, I think there's something really important about that, which is that I think that the gay part or the queer part is the understanding that the masculinity is the result of a performance, that it is not natural, that it is something that is constructed and made up. And that's something that happens, It you know, that, that that happens in these pictures so clearly because obviously somebody's drawing them so they have to make all of those marks. But I, I, I agree with you that it's like in these other photographs, it's like the queer part is the, per the perception that this masculinity is the result of a performance. Yeah, and now, and now it's like, you know, it's pronouns and it's what does this jacket mean now in this community with those pants cut that way? And it's suddenly there's, you know, there's a hundred uniforms, there's a hundred possibilities. Yeah. Is there a final question or are we going to thank everybody for coming and I don't see any hands. Thank Thanks, you, Artist Space. Thanks, panel.